Brady versus Maryland. Supreme Court of the United States. Certiorari to the Court of Appeals of Maryland. Opinion of the Court by Mr. Justice Douglas. Announced by Mr. Justice Brennan. Petitioner and a companion, Boblet, were found guilty of murder in the first degree and were sentenced to death, their convictions being affirmed by the Court of Appeals of Maryland. Their trials were separate, Petitioner being tried first. At his trial, Brady took the stand and admitted his participation in the crime, but he claimed that Boblet did the actual killing. And in summation to the jury, Brady's counsel conceded that Brady was guilty of murder in the first degree, asking only that the jury return a verdict without capital punishment. Prior to the petitioner's counsel, had requested the prosecution to allow him to examine Bob Lett's extrajudicial statements. Several of those statements were shown to him, but one dated July the 9th, 1958, in which Bob Lett admitted the actual homicide, was withheld by the prosecution and did not come to the petitioner's notice until after he had been tried, convicted, and sentenced, and after his conviction had been affirmed. Petitioner moved the trial court for a new trial based on the newly discovered evidence that had been suppressed by the prosecution. Petitioner's appeal from denial of that motion was dismissed by the Court of Appeals without prejudice to relief under Maryland's Post-Conviction Procedure Act. The petition for post-conviction relief was dismissed by the trial court, and on appeal, the Court of Appeals held that suppression of the evidence by the prosecution denied petitioner due process of law and remanded the case for a retrial of the question of punishment, not the question of guilt. This case is here on certiorari. The crime in question was murder, committed in the perpetration of a robbery. Punishment for that crime is life imprisonment or death, the jury being empowered to restrict the punishment to life by the issue of words without capital punishment. In Maryland, by reason of the state's constitution, the jury in a criminal case are judges of law as well as of fact. The question presented is whether the petitioner was denied a federal right when the Court of Appeals restricted the new trial to the question of punishment. We agree with the Court of Appeals that suppression of this confession was violation of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. The Court of Appeals relied in Maine on two decisions from the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, United States X. Rel. Almeida v. Baldi and United States X. Rel. Thompson v. Dye, which we agree state the correct constitutional rule. This ruling is an extension of Mahoney v. Holland, in which the court ruled on what non-disclosure by prosecutor violates due process. It is a requirement that cannot be deemed to satisfy by mere notice and hearing. If a state has contrived a conviction through pretense of trial, which in truth is used but as a means of depriving a defendant of liberty through a deliberate deception of court and jury by presentation of testimony known to be perjured, such a contrivance by a state to procure the conviction and imprisonment of a defendant is as inconsistent with the rudimentary demands of justice as is the obtaining of a like result by intimidation. In Powell versus Kansas, we phrase the rule in broader terms. Petitioner's papers are inexpertly drawn, but they do set forth allegations that his imprisonment resulted from perjured testimony, knowingly used by the state authorities to obtain his conviction, and from the deliberate suppression by those same authorities of evidence favorable to him. These allegations sufficiently charge a deprivation of rights guaranteed by the federal constitution and, if proven, would entitle petitioner to release from his present custody, citing Mahoney v. Holland. The Third Circuit in the Baldy case construed that statement in Powell v. Kansas to mean that suppression of evidence favorable to the accused was itself sufficient to amount to a denial of due process.
In the Purr versus Illinois, we extended that test formulated in Mahoney versus Holland when we said the same results obtains when the state, although not soliciting false evidence, allows it to go uncorrected when it appears. And see Alcurta versus Texas, Wally versus, Wally versus Wyoming, Durrell versus Mayo. We now hold that suppression by the prosecution of evidence favorable to an accused upon request violates due process where the evidence is material to either guilt or to punishment, irrespective of the good faith or bad faith of the prosecution. The principle of Mahoney versus Holland is not punishment of society for misdeeds of a prosecutor, but avoidance of an unfair trial to the accused. Society wins not only when the guilt are convicted, but when criminal trials are fair. Our system of the administration of justice suffers when any accused is treated unfairly. An inscription on the walls of the Department of Justice states the proposition candidly for the federal domain. The United States wins its point whenever justice is done, its citizens in the courts. A prosecution that withholds evidence on demand of the accused, which, if made available, would tend to exculpate him or reduce the penalty, helps shape a trial that bears heavily on the defendant. That casts the prosecutor in the role of an architect of a proceeding that does not comport with standards of justice, even though, as in the present case, his actions are not the result of guile, to use the words of a court of appeal. The question remains whether Petitioner was denied a constitutional right when the Court of Appeals restricted his new trial to the question of punishment. In justification of that ruling, the Court of Appeals stated, There is considerable doubt as to how much good Bob Lett's undisclosed confession would have done Brady if it had been before the jury. It clearly implicated Brady as being the one who wanted to strangle the victim, Brooks. Bob Lett, according to this statement, also favored killing him but one to do it by shooting. We cannot put ourselves in the place of the jury and assume what their views would have been as to whether it did or did not matter, whether it was Brady's hands or Bob Lett's hands that twisted the shirt around the victim's neck. It would be too dogmatic for us to say the jury would not have attached any significance to this evidence in considering the punishment of the defendant Brady. Not without some doubt, we conclude that withholding of this particular confession of Bob Lett was prejudicial to the defendant Brady. The appellant's sole claim of prejudice goes to the punishment imposed. If Bob Lett's withheld confession had been before the jury, nothing in it could have reduced the appellant's Brady's offense below murder in the first degree. We therefore see no occasion to retry that issue. If this were a jurisdiction where the judge was not the judge of law, a different question would have been presented. But since it is, how can the Maryland Court of Appeals state that nothing in the suppressed confession could have reduced petitioner's offense below murder in the first degree? If, as a matter of Maryland law, juries could, in criminal cases, could determine the admissibility of such evidence on the issue of innocence or guilt, the question would seem to be foreclosed. But Maryland's constitutional provision, making the jury in a criminal case the judges of law, does not mean precisely what it seems to say. The present status of that provision was renewed recently in Giles v. State, appeal dismissed, where the several exceptions added by statute or carved out by judicial construction are reviewed. One of those exceptions, material here, is that trial courts have always passed and still pass on the admissibility of evidence the jury may consider on the issue of innocence or guilt of the accused. The cases cited make up a long line going back nearly half a century. Wheeler v. State stated, the instructions to the jury were advisory only, except in regards to questions as which shall be considered as evidence. And the court, having such right, it follows of course, that it also has the right to prevent counsel from arguing against such an instruction. Citing Bell v. State, Beard v. State, Dick v. State, Vogel v. State. We usually walk upon treacherous ground when we explore state law, 
for state courts, state agencies, and state legislatures are the final expositors under our federal regime. But as we read the Maryland decisions, it is the court, not the jury, that passes on the admissibility of evidence pertinent to the issue of innocence or guilt of the accused, citing Giles v. State. In present case, a unanimous court of appeals has said nothing in the suppression confession could have reduced the appellant Brady offense below murder in the first degree. We read that statement as a ruling on the admissibility of the confession on the issue of innocence or guilt. A sporting theory of justice might assume that if the suppressed confession had been used at the first trial, the judge's ruling that it was not admissible on the issue of innocence or guilt might have been flouted by the jury, just as it might have been done if the court first admitted a confession and then stricken it from the record. But we cannot raise that trial strategy to the dignity of the constitutional right and say that the deprival of the defendant of that sporting chance through use of a bifurcated trial, see for example Williams versus New York, denies him due process or violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Affirmed. Separate Opinion of Mr. Justice White The Maryland Court appealed, Appeals declared the suppression or withholding by the state of material evidence exculpatory to an accused is violation of due process without citing the United States Constitution or the Maryland's Constitution, which also has a due process clause. We therefore cannot be sure which constitution was invoked by the court below, and thus whether the state, the only party aggrieved by this portion of judgment, could even bring the issue here if it desired to do so. C. New York City versus Central Savings Bank. Minnesota versus National Tea Company. But in any event, there's no cross-petition by the state, nor has it challenged the correctness of the ruling below that a new trial on punishment was called for by requirements of due process. In my view, therefore, the court should not reach the due process question which it decides. It certainly is not the case, as may be suggested, that without it we would have only a state law question. For assuming the court below was correct in finding a violation of petitioner's right in the suppression of evidence, the federal question he wants decided here still remains, namely, whether denying him a new trial on guilt, as well as punishment, deprives him of equal protection. There is thus a federal question to deal with in this court. See, for example, Bell v. Hood. Wholly aside from the due process question involving a suppression of evidence, the majority opinion makes this unmistakably clear. Before dealing with due process issue, it states, the question presented is whether petitioner was denied a federal right when the Court of Appeals restricted the new trial to the question of punishment. After discussing at some length and deposing of suppression matter in the federal constitutional terms, it says the question still to be decided is the same as it was before. The question remains whether the petitioner was denied a constitutional right when the Court of Appeals restricted his new trial to the question of punishment. The result, of course, is that the due process discussion by the Court is wholly advisory. In any event, the Court's due process advice goes substantially beyond the holding below. I would employ more confining language and would not cast in constitutional form a broad rule of criminal discovery. Instead, I would leave this task, at least for now, to the rulemaking or legislative process after full consideration by legislatures, bench, and bar. I concur with the court's disposition of petition's equal protection argument. Mr. Justice Harlan, with whom Mr. Justice Black joined, dissenting. I think this case presents only a single federal question. Did the order of the Maryland Court of Appeals granting a new trial, limited to the issue of punishment, violate petitioner's 14th Amendment rights to equal protection? In my opinion, an affirmative answer would be required if the Boblet statement would have been admissible on the issue of guilt at petitioner's original trial. This indeed seems to be the clear implication of the court's opinion. The court, however, notes the 14th Amendment was not infringed because it considers the Court of Appeals' opinion 
and the other Maryland cases dealing with Maryland's constitutional provision, making juries in criminal cases, the judges of law, as well as of fact, as establishing that the Bob Lett statement would not have been admissible at the original trial on the issue of petitioner's guilt. But I cannot read the Court of Appeals opinion with any such assurance. That opinion can as easily, and perhaps more easily, be seen to be indicating that a new trial limitation, followed by the Court of Appeals concept of power, under Section 645G of the Maryland Post-Conviction Procedures Act, Maryland Code, Article 27, 1960, Supplement, and Rule 870 of the Maryland Rules of Procedure, to fashion appropriate relief mean the particular circumstances of this case, rather than from the view of the Bob Lett statement, would have been relevant at the original trial only on the issue of punishment. This interpretation is indeed fortified by the Court of Appeals' earlier general discussion as to the admissibility of third-party confessions, which falls short of saying anything that is dispositive of the crucial issue here. Nor do I find anything in any of the other Maryland cases cited by this court, which bears on the admissibility, vel non, of the Bob Lett statement on the issue of guilt. None of these cases suggest anything more relevant here then the jury may not overrule the trial court on questions related to the admissibility of evidence. Indeed, there are by no means clear as to what happened if the jury undertakes to do so. In this very case, for example, the trial court charged in the final analysis, the jury are judges of both the law and facts, and the verdict in this case is entirely the jury's responsibility. Moreover, the uncertainty on the score is compounded by the state's acknowledgement at the oral argument here that the withheld Bob Lett statement would have been admissible at trial on the issue of guilt. In this state of uncertainty as to the proper answer to the critical understanding of the state law, and in view of the fact that the Court of Appeals did not in terms address itself to the equal protection question, I do not see how we can properly resolve this case at this juncture. I think the appropriate course is for us to vacate the judgment of the Court of Appeals and remand this case to that court for further consideration in light of the governing constitutional principles stated at the outset of this opinion. This has been a reading of the opinion, concurring opinion, and dissenting opinion in Brady v. Maryland, Supreme Court of the United States, decided May the 13th in 1963 from a writ of certiorari to the Court of Maryland, Appeals of Maryland. If you enjoyed this content, please remember to give it a like. I hope all is well. Till later, my friends. Cheers and goodbye.